Hello, welcome to second lesson on histology after the previous lesson which entailed introduction to histology. Here today, according to our outline, we are going to check on the one or two categories of, I mean, the tissues. Now we're going to start with the connective tissues. Within the connective tissue, we are going to check on the overview generally, and then we'll check on the fibrous connective tissue, cartilage, bone, and blood. For foremost, we need to know which objectives are we supposed to attain at the end of this lesson. First and foremost, you are expected to describe the properties that most connective tissue have in common, discuss the types of cells found in connective tissue, explain what the matrix of connective tissue is and describe its components. You are also expected to name 10 types of connective tissue, describe their cellular components and matrix and explain what distinguishes them from each other. Visually, you're supposed also to recognize each connective tissue type from specimen or photograph. So let's just start from the first. That is, you're going to do the overview part. In the overview, we are going to check on the function. So first and foremost, I want to start by saying connective tissue typically consists mostly of fibers and the ground substances which we had already talked about. So with widely separated cells, it is the most abundant, that is, that is connective tissue, very abundant and widely distributed and histologically variable of the four primary tissues. So as the name implies, it often serves to connect organs to each other. That is why it is called connective tissue. Now, for example, the way a tendon connects muscle to bones, right? Now, the idea there is in other ways to support and bind and protect organs, that is the tendon's effective way. So this category of tissue, that is connective tissue, includes fibrous tissue, fat, cartilage, bone, and blood. I repeat, fibrous tissue, fat, cartilage, bone, and blood. And the function of the connective tissue are as what you are able to see from your hand. First one is binding of organs. And in the binding of organs, tendons, for example, bind muscles to bone. Ligaments binds one bone to another bone. And the fat holds the kidneys and eyes in place. And fibrous tissues bind the skin to underlying muscles. When you check on the support, bones support the body and cartilage support the ears, nose, trachea, and bronchi. In physical protection, the cranium, which we all know and we have it, in our, I mean the superior part of our body, and the cranium act as a caution or protect the delicate organ of brain, ribs protect the lungs, and heart that is protected by sternum and ribs as well. So the fatty cations around the kidney and eyes also protect these organs. And when you check about the immune protection as a function of connective tissue, immune protection, you need to think about the blood itself. It's one of the liquid connective tissue. So connective tissue cells attack foreign invaders and connective tissue fibers form a battlefield. For example, under the skin and mucous membrane where immune cells can be quickly mobilized against diseases and agents. Especially this is widely seen when you talk about inflammation. And for the clinical medicine students, you did inflammation in first year semester one in general pathology. Nursing class will have the inflammatory process done on med surgical unit in 1.2. So you will see how the various inflammatory mediators play a vital role in managing and defending the body in terms of immunity. Another function is movement. And when you talk about movement, bones provide the liver system for body movement. So cartilages are involved in movement of the vocal cords. And cartilages on bone surface ease joint movement as well. And when you check on storage as a function of connective tissue, fat is the body's, your fat actually, is the most body's major energy reserve. And the bone is also a reserve of calcium and phosphorus that can be drawn upon when needed. Heat production. How is connective tissue aiding heat production? 
Brown fat generates it in infants and children. When you talk about transport, blood transport, gases, nutrients, waste hormones, and blood cells as well. So the message time that we describe in embryonic germ layers, so when we describe it earlier in this in the same same chapter of histology, is a form of embryonic connective tissue. So the connective tissue is that present after birth. So it falls into three broad categories and we are going to check it. So we are going to see fibrous connective tissues, supportive connective tissue, and fluid connective tissue. So I need you to know that mesenchyme that came from uh, mesoderm. It divides diverse widely into fibrous connective tissue, right? And you see example of fibrous connective tissue. And then you see supportive connective tissues such as cartilage and bone. And then you check on fluid connective tissues, which is blood at most. So we are going to see that one, and the first and foremost, we are going to start by fibrous connective tissue. So here in fibrous connective tissue, from your hand, you are able to see components of fibrous connective tissue. We have cells, right, and we have fibers. So those are what entails the cells of the connective tissue. So the component of fibrous connective tissue, all the cells of the component of uh, 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 fibrous connective tissue are like the fibroblasts, the macrophages, the leukocytes or the white blood cells, plasma cells, mast cells, and adipocytes. So we want to discuss each of them, the six, and then you're done, and then you got the fibers. So first and foremost, I need to tell you that fibrous connective tissue are the most diverse type of connective tissue, and they are also called fibroconnective tissue or fibroconnective tissue. Or you can also call them connective tissue proper. And again, nearly all connective tissues contain fibers, but the tissues considered here are classified together because the fibers are so conspicuous. So fibers are of course just one component of the tissue, so which also includes cells and ground substances. But before examining specific type of fibroconnective tissue, we need to know first the component, and that is why we want to check on the cells and the fiber. So let's begin by the cells. So that is the foremost thing. Let's begin with the cells. Now from your hand, you are able to read them, and you're going to see that the cells of fibrous connective tissue include fibroblasts, macrophages, leukocytes, plasma cells, and mast cells, and adipocytes. So let's start with one. Fibroblasts, these are large flat cells that often appear tapered at the handle and uh, it's somehow slender. They are like wispy branches, yeah? And I'll share the images so that you can see them. So they produce the fibers and ground substances that form the matrix of the tissue. So their main purpose is to produce the fibers. Don't forget, fibroblast produces the fibers. So when they produce the fibers and the ground substances, that now will form the matrix of the tissue. So the fibroblasts that have finished this task of producing what we call as the fibers, they now become inactive and are now called fibrocytes and not fibroblasts. Most histologists are likely to call them fibrocytes. Away from fibroblasts, let's go to macrophages. In the macrophages, these are large phagocytic cells that wander through the connective tissue where they engulf and destroy bacteria. So we have other foreign particles and dead or dying cells of our own body can also be phagocyte by the macrophages. Like even the active, they, they also activate the immune system when they sense foreign matters called antigens. I know you know about the antigens. And so they help also to activate the immune system. Again, another important thing that you should not forget that they arise from certain white blood cells called the monocytes. Or they can as well come from the same stem cell that produced monocytes. So they can either come from the monocytes or produced by the monocytes. I mean, by the cell that produces the monocytes. Away from that, let's go to the leukocytes. The leukocytes, or what we commonly refer to as the white blood cells. Actually, I need you to know that they travel briefly in the bloodstream than the red blood cells. So after traveling briefly, they will now start crawling out through the capillary walls and what you're always informed it's called diapedesis. And they'll spend most of their time in the connective tissue and most of them are neutrophil, which will now wander about in search of bacteria. And then our mucous membrane will often exhibit dense patches of tiny white blasts called the lymphocytes, which reacts against bacteria toxins and other foreign agents. 
Let's talk about the plasma cells. I know you've heard about the plasma cells in immunity and so on and so forth. But here, plasma cells, they are like certain lymphocytes which turn into plasma cells. So these lymphocytes change into plasma cells when they detect foreign agents. And then the plasma cells then synthesize disease-fighting proteins called the antibodies. And then plasma cells are rarely seen except in the walls of the intestine and inflamed tissue. So you need to know that. Then on the mast cells, mast cells, I know you know mast cells. If you do pharmacology, you know mast cells stabilize drugs like nedochromaline, right? So normally these ones are just given in case of allergy or when you are having allergic reaction or histaminic pathological manifestation. So mast cells, these cells, they are found especially alongside blood vessels and they secrete a common chemical which we can call heparin that inhibit blood clotting. I know that one you know. And one chemical which is called histamine that is very, very known that increases blood flow by dilating blood vessels. So actually we know histamine is always responsible for allergic reaction. And if an allergy is persistent without being treated, you can end up with something which is called uh, I, I, you, you, can, you can end up in a shock, right? Yeah, anaphylactic shock. So that is that. So when we talk about mast cells, you know its function can produce heparin and histamine, and that is why when you have allergy, you can be given mast cell stabilizers or more that. Those drug categories, they just stabilize the mast cells, and therefore the mast cell cannot burst to release histamine. Let's talk about the adipocytes or fat cells. Now, adipocytes are the cells of the fat. Adipocytes. So these are the large rounded cells filled mainly with a droplet of triglyceride, which forces the nucleus and cytoplasm to occupy only a thin layer just beneath the plasma membrane. So they normally appear in small clusters in some fibrous connective tissue. So what I want that when when they dominate an area of the tissue. Okay, they are fat cells, of course, but when they are too many, we call them the adipose tissue because many cells form tissue. So that is that. And I'll talk about fibroblasts, macrophages, leukocytes, blah, 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 up to adipose cells. So let's check on the next thing. That is the fibers. In front of you, you can see another component of connective tissues are fibers. The component of the fibers are like the collagen or so the collagen, reticular fibers, and elastic fibers. And here we are going to talk about them. First and foremost, I need to talk about the, what we call the collagenous or the collagenous fibers. So the collagenous fibers, these fibers made of collagen are tough and flexible, right? And uh, they resist, they resist, they resist what we call as the stretching effect. So collagen is about 25% of the body's protein. And the most abundant types, the best of such animal products are gelatin, leather, and glue. So in fresh tissue, the collagen fibers have a glistening white appearance seen in tendons and some cuts of meat. So they are often called white fibers in the tissue section, and collagens form coarse wavy bundles, often dyed pink, blue, or green, with the most common histological stains. Examples of collagens are like the tendons, yeah, the ligaments, and the deep layer of the skin. And they are the made of mainly of collagen. So they are less visible collagen for all the matters of the collagen bones. Now I want to give you an example of an image so that at least you can see when I mean tendons, what I mean. This is a cadaver which has just been uh, unpeeled off from the skin. So I want you to see it. And I'm sure you're able to see what I'm talking about already. That is it. I don't know if you can see it. Okay, away from it because it, it is not coming. Okay, that is it. That is an example of something which you call a tendon, right? That's a tendon, a tendon. So where you can see some, those are tendons now, right? You can see how it look like. So they're made up of collagenous fibers. So away from that, let us talk about the reticular fibers. And in reticular fibers, I wanted to be able to see, these are thin collagen fibers cons uh, which are coated like with glycoproteins. 
So they form a sponge-like framework for such organs such as the spleen and lymph nodes. So mostly they are present in the spleen and the lymph nodes and also a lymph, lymph tissues. Then again on the elastic fibers, elastic fibers just the thinner and the collagenous. They are more thinner than the collagenous fibers and they branch and rejoin each other had along the course. So they are joining one another and they joins and they are, you know, like they are branching and joining each other. So they are made up of the protein called elastin. So they are so coiled there. Eh? The coiled structure allows it to stretch and recoil like a rubber band. And I need to know that elastic fibers account for the ability of the skin, lungs, and artery to spring back after they are stretched. And you need to know that elasticity is not the ability to stretch, but the tendency to recoil when tension is released. So fresh elastic fibers are yellowish and they are often called yellow fibers. So that is that. In the next part, we are going to see and still on the fibrous connective tissue, we are going to see what we call the ground substances. So fibrous connective tissue still have the ground substances, which is composed of the glycosaminoglycans, or what we refer to as the GAG, and the proteoglycans, and the adhesive glycoprotein. So we need to talk about all these. So first of all, what is the ground substance? So amid the cells and the fibers in some tissue section, there appears to be a lot of empty spaces. So in life, these spaces is occupied by the featureless ground substance. Ground substance usually has a glutinous and rubbery consistency resulting from the three classes of large molecules. And that is what you're able to see, glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, and adhesive glycoproteins. So with all the mightiness and all the clarity, so let me just talk about each of them. So first and foremost, that you need to know a glycosaminoglycan is a long polysaccharide composed of an Usual disaccharides called amino sugars and uranic acid. They are negatively charged and thus tend to attract sodium and potassium and ion, these glycosaminoglycans, because of its negativity. So, if we told it told you it attracts sodium and potassium ion, it can cause the glycosaminoglycans to absorb and hold water, because we always know that sodium attracts water. Therefore, the glycosaminoglycans plays an important role in regulating the water and electrolytes balance of the tissue. And the most abundant glycosaminoglycans is chondroitin. The chondroitin sulfate, the chondroitin sulfate is one of the examples. So it is abundant in blood vessels and bones and is responsible for the relative stiffness of cartilage. And some of the gas, that is the glycosaminoglycans that you really know or read elsewhere, in some books like heparin, an antilog, and something anticoagulant, yeah, hydroluric acid, hydroluric acid, yeah, the latch, and so on. So, yeah, the hydroluric acid is a gigantic molecule, like for example, up to 20 micrometer long, as large as most cells. So, it is vicious, a slippery substance that forms a very effective lubricant in the joints and constituents much of the jelly like virus humor at the high point. So, I needed to know that. For example, a proteoglycan is another gigantic molecule. It is shaped somewhat like a test tube brush with a central core composed of protein and the bristle outgrowth composed of the glycosaminoglycan. Now I'm on the, what we refer to as the proteoglycans. I've said it's a gigantic molecule, so big, so it's it shaped somewhat like a test tube brush, yeah? And then thus I got a central core which contain a protein and the breast like out growth composed of what we talked about that is glycosaminoglycans. So the entire proteoglycan may be attached to hyaluronic acid, thus forming an enormous molecule complex. So the proteoglycans will form thick colloids similar to uh, those of the gravio particle, gelatin, and glue. And then the gel, gel, what we call as the gel, slows the spread of pathogenic organism through the tissue. Some proteoglycans will be found embedded in the plasma membrane of cells, yeah, and they are tied to the cytoskeleton on the skin side or maybe in the extracellular molecules of the, the outside of the cell. So thus they, 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 they create a strong structural bond between cells and the extracellular molecules and help to hold tissues together. So that is that, and I have an image of such, but uh, I don't know if it is important. You see how the layout is outlined, but uh, it's good to show you that so that at least you can figure it out from your own perspective. So this one is an example of one. This one is an example of one. 
can't see it from here. I wonder it looks like. Very bit. But you can see we have a coprotein, like aminoglycans and proteoglycans. Very bit. So let's talk about the adhesive glycoproteins, which is the last one in this case. So in adhesive glycoprotein, there are protein carbohydrate complex that bind plasma membranes, proteins to collagens, yeah, and proteoglycans outside the cell. So they bind all the components of a tissue together and mark pathways that guide migrating embryonic cells to other destinations in a tissue. That is all about adhesive glycoprotein. This function just defines its name. So the next slide is what we have. Uh, the types of fibrous connective tissue, which I said, they are broadly classified into two loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue. So under loose connective tissue is where we have areolar tissue, we have reticular tissue, adipose tissue. Then in dense connective tissue, there are two, dense regular connective tissue and dense irregular connective tissue. So we're going to check onto them. So let's start with the first, loose connective tissue. Now, let me first give you an highlight that fibrous connective tissue is divided into a broad category, I repeat, according to the relative abundance of each fiber inside it. So we have loose and dense connective tissue. So in loose connective tissue, much of the spaces is occupied by ground substance, which is dissolved out of the tissue during histological fixation and leaves empty spaces in the prepared tissue section. So the loose connective tissue we will discuss here are like areola, reticular, and adipose tissue. Then we have dense connective tissue, which fibers occupy now more spaces than the cells and the ground substances and appears closely packed in the tissue section. So the two dense connective tissue we, we will discuss are dense regular and dense irregular connective tissue. So again here I need to know that areola, as we are going to discuss about the loose connective tissue, start with areola. So areola tissue, it always exhibits loosely organized fibers, abundant blood vessels, and a lot of seemingly empty space. So at most, it will realize it possesses all six of the aforementioned cell types. So its fibers run in random directions, right? They run in random direction. And uh, again, another important thing that you need to know is that when they run in random direction and are mostly collagenous, but very elastic and reticular fibers are very, very present at all times. So areolar tissue, they are highly variable in appearance and in many serious membrane, it looks like uh, what I'm going to show you down here, yeah? but in the skin and mucous membrane, it is more compact and sometimes difficult to distinguish from dense irregular connective tissue. And some advice on how to tell the apart is given after the discussion. I'll, show, I'll tell you after uh, we've discussed the dense irregular connective tissue. So still on the areola, tissue which is found in the tissue section from almost every part of the body. It surrounds blood vessels and nerves and penetrate with them even into the small spaces of muscles, tendons and other tissues. So nearly every epithelium rests on a layer of areolar tissue whose blood vessels provide the epithelium with nutrition, waste removals and ready supply of infection fighting white blood cells in times of need. So because of the abundance of open fluid filled spaces, white blood cells can move about freely in areolar tissue and can easily find and destroy pathogens. In loose connective tissue, we still have reticular tissue. Now, in reticular tissue is a mesh of reticular fibers, fibroblasts, so it forms the structural framework that is trauma of such organs and tissue, and as well as the lymph nodes, spleen, thymus, and blah, 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 and uh, bone marrow as well, yeah? So the space to meet the fiber is filled with the blood cells. Katikati your fiber kuna blood cells. So if you imagine a kitchen sponge soaked with the blood, the sponge fibers will be analogous to reticular tissue stroma. Again on adipose tissue, the last one in loose connective tissues. Tissue is a fat tissue species in which adipocytes are the dominant cell type. So adipocytes may occupy singly or in small cluster in areolar tissue. So adipocytes usually range from 70 to 120 micrometer in diameters, but they may be, yeah, they may be five times as large as in obese people. And the space between adipocytes is occupied by areolar tissue, reticular tissue, and blood capillaries. So let's check, talk about the fat. Fat is the body's primary energy reserve, right? 
So the quantity of stored triglycerides and the number of adipocytes are quite stable in a person. But this doesn't mean that stored fat is stagnant. New triglycerides are constantly synthesized and stored as others are hydrolyzed and released into the circulation. So therefore, there is a constant turnover of stored triglycerides with an equilibrium between synthesis and hydrolysis, and energy storage and energy uses. So adipose tissues also provide thermal insulation and contribute to body continuum such as the female breast and hips. So and the most adipose tissue is a type called white fat, but with something to do with fetuses, infants, and children also have heat generating tissue called brown fat, which accounts for up to 5% of an infant's weight. So the brown fats get its color from an unusual abundance of blood vessels and certain enzymes in its droplet rather than the one large one. So brown fat is number like numerous in sky, number let me say like mitochondrion, but the evolution or oxidation pathway is not linked to ATP synthesis. Therefore, when these cells oxidize fast, they will now release all the energy as heat. And then the hibernating animals accumulate brown fats in preparation for winter. That is like an adaptive mode. So that is that. So away from this, I know we are going good. And the speed is just cool. We see on dense regular connective tissue. These are named for two proper tissues. The collagen fibers, which are closely packed. And that is what I, I, you're, you're able to see. But before we go to that place, I would like you to see the following images about the loose connective tissue. I hope from your hand you're able to see that is areola, reticular tissue, and the tissue of the skin. You can see where they are formed, like this one is this nude, you have the intestine, and you have other one is the small tissue in the back. You need to know these tissues and where they are also the form of the other. One way or the other you cannot be confused by the same. So away from that, let's start on the on the other branch or dense connective tissue. But before we go there, I would like us to see a clinical case here which you refer to as Marfan syndrome. And so far so good. Uh -huh. Let's finish that before I come to Marfan syndrome. So let's talk about dense connective tissue. So in dense regular connective tissue and dense irregular connective tissue, and I've said in dense regular connective tissue, we have two properties. The collagen fibers, which are closely packed and live lay relatively little space, and the fibers that are parallel to each other. So it's either we have collagen fibers which are closely packed or the ones which are parallel to each other. And they are found especially in tendons and ligaments. The parallel arrangement of the fibers is an adaptation to the fact that the tendons and ligaments are fully in critical predictable directions and now with some many expectations such as blood vessels and sensory nerve fibers the only cells in the tissue are fibroblasts visible by their slender violet staining nuclei squeezed between bundles of collagen so this type of tissue has few blood vessels or injured tendons and ligaments are slow to heal at all and you need to know that at all so the vocal cord, for example, and suspensory ligament of the tennis and some ligament of the vertebral column are made up of types of dense regular connective tissue called the yellow elastic tissue. And again, in addition to the densely packed collagen, it exhibits branching elastic fibers and more fibroblasts. So the fibroblasts have large more conspicuous nuclei than seen in most of the dense regular connective tissue. So again, I need you to know that elastic tissue also takes the form of, of a wavy sheets in the walls of the large and the medium arteries. And when the heart pumps blood into the arteries, these sheets enable them to expand and relieve some of the pressures on smaller vessels downstream. So when the heart relaxes, the arterial wall springs back and now it will keep the blood pressure from dropping to low between heartbeats. And the importance of this elastic tissue becomes especially clear when there is no enough of it. For example, in what I want to tell you about the Marfan syndrome. So we have talked about Marfan syndrome, but when it is stiffened by arterial sclerosis. That is all about dense regular connective tissue. And let us talk about dense irregular connective tissue. Now in dense irregular connective tissue, you have said also as a thick bundles of collagen have relatively little room for cells and ground substances. But the collagen bundle runs in random directions. So this is not that the other one. So this arrangement enables the tissue to resist unpredictable stresses. So these tissues constitute most of the dummies where it binds the skin to the underlying muscles and connective tissues. 
It also forms a protective capsule around organs such as the kidneys, testes, and spleen, and tough fibrous sheath around the bones, nerves, and the muscles. So it is sometimes difficult to judge whether tissue is areolar or dense irregular. But in the dummies, for example, these tissues occur side by side, and the transition from one to another is not all obvious. So a relatively large amount of clear space suggests areolar tissue and thicker bands of collagen with relatively little clear space suggest dense irregular tissue. And that is all. So in short, that is what we are talking about. So when I show you this image, I wanted you to see, we have areolar reticular tissue and blah, blah, blah. There are plenty of images. And as I told you before, normally inquire for the images so that at least you can familiarize with them. You can text me. That's Rauma through my email, number will be found in our website, Medical Hospital Sarena. Just go to Google and type Medical Hospital Sarena. The first site will be what you can access us with. So the next thing we're going to check on the clinical application of this idea. And that is here. I'm going to take you through what we call a disease which is called Marfan syndrome. So in Marfan syndrome, as you can see, the serious anatomical and functional abnormalities which can result from hereditary errors in the structure of connective tissue proteins. So Marfan syndrome in the great case, for example, result from mutations of genes on a chromosome that calls for a glycoprotein called fibrillin, the structural scaffold for elastic fiber. So clinical signs of Marfan syndrome include unusual tall stature, long limbs, and spidery fingers abnormal spinal cavity, and a protruding pigeon breast. So some other signs include hyperextensible joints, hernias of the groins, and visible problems resulting from abnormality, long eyeballs, and deformed lenses. So more seriously, victims exhibit weakening of the heart valves and arterial valves. So the heart where blood pressure is the highest, sometimes can almost slide the electric close to the heart, and they may suddenly rupture. So Marfan syndrome is present in about 1 out of 20,000 live births and kills most of its victims by their mid-30s. So some authorities think that Abraham Lincoln's tall, jungly, and physical and spidely fingers is the cause signs of Marfan syndrome, and by the end I come more prematurely. So, however, this one has not been as a, that uh, he not been assassinated. This one could be the case, but it, he was assassinated anyway. So that is that. So let's talk about cartilage and bone and blood. In the next part, we're going to see this cartilage. So we are going to see cartilage and talk about the chondroblasts, the leukinae, and chondrocytes. Then you see type of cartilage, talk about the hanging cartilage, the elastic cartilage, and fibro cartilage. Don't forget this one, they're very key things. So let's start with cartilage. So first thing you need to know about cartilage is a supportive connective tissue with a flexible rubbery matrix it gives shape to the external ear, the type of the nose, and the, that is the tip of the nose and the larynx, that is the voice, voice box. The most easily palpated cartilage in the body is cells called the chondroblast. So the chondroblast will secrete the matrix and surround themselves with it until they become trapped in a little cavity called the lacunae. So the lacunae, that is it. So once enclosed in the lacunae, the cells are called the chondrocyte now. So from the chondroblast, inside the lacunae, we have the, con uh, the chondrocyte. The cartilage is free of blood vessels except when transforming into bones. Thus, nutrition and waste removal depend on the solid diffusion through the stiff matrix because this is a slow process. So the chondrocytes have low rates of metabolism and cell division, and the injured cartilage is slowly. And again, I needed to know that the matrix is rich in chondroitin tensulfate, which we already talked about in the previous session. And it contains collagen fibers that range in the thickness from its visible fine to conspicuous core. So difference in the fibers provide a basic of classifying cartilage into the three types. So we have the hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage, the way you're seeing them. So let's start with the first one, that is hyaline cartilage. It is named for its clear, glassy, microscopic appearance, which stems from the usually invisible fineness of its collagen fibers. So let's talk about the elastic cartilage again. It's named for its in and the what we call the conspicuous elastic fiber. That is why it's called the elastic uh, cartilage. Another one is fibrocartilage, which is named for its coarse, readily visible bundles of I mean of collagen. And we have elastic cartilage, mostly hyaline cartilages, yeah, which are actually are surrounded by sheets of dense irregular connective tissue, which are called the perichondrium. 
Dr. Anidhi also to know about the reserve population of chondroblasts between the pericondrium and the cartilage, which contribute to the cartilage growth throughout life. And there is no pericondrium around fibrocartilages. And you can also feel the texture of hyaline cartilage by palpating the tip of your nose. That is, and then again, your Adam's apples, I know you know it, at the front of the larynx, that is the voice box. And you can also see the periodic rings of cartilage around the trachea, just below the larynx. So the hyaline cartilage is usually seen in the main notary writing. It is the gray stroke at the end of the pork rib, right? And on the chicken leg and the, and the breastbone, yeah, and at the joints, the feet, hips, in feet, for example, that is that. So elastic cartilage is just to the external ear. You can get some idea of it being just like holding your ear down and relaxing the cartilage. So let's talk about that and then we go on to bone. Cartilage is that. That is that. So on bone, we are talking about the osseous tissue, spongy bone, compact desk bone, central, that is the avastian or anic canals, concentric lamella, histion, and this side, canulicula, and peristia. So what you're seeing there is what we want to be discussing bone. So first of all, the term bones refer to both to organs of the body such as the femur and the bone nipples, composed of multiple tissue types, and to the bones tissue or the osseous tissue, what you call osseous tissue. Tissue. What you're seeing there is bone tissue, osseous tissue, bone tissue. That's the other name. So that makes up most of the mass of the bone. So there are two forms of osseous tissue. One is spongy bone, and the other one is compact dense bone. So the spongy bones fill the heads of the long bones, although it is calcified and hard, so it delicate levers and plates give it a spongy appearance. And then the compact dense bone is more of, a, let's say, more of a dense calcified tissue with no spaces visible to the naked eye. So it forms the external surface of all bones. So spongy bones, when present, it's always covered by compact bone. And the difference between the compact and the spongy bone are described, so we're going to check them later. So here we examine only compact chips of the head, dried bone, ground, and microscope uh, findings. In such a preparation, the cells are absent, but spaces reveal their femur location. And the most compact bone is arranged in cylinders of tissue that surround central avasian or restraining canals, which run longitudinal through the shafts of long bones such as the femur. And blood vessels and uh, the nervous travel through the central canals and lie, and the bone matrix deposit in the concentric lama lie, an onion-like layers here, yeah, around each central canal, yeah, and a central canal and its surrounding lamellae are called an ostion. Central canal and its surrounding lamellae are called the ostion. So tiny lacani between the lamellae are occupied in life by mature bone cells or what we refer to as the, what we refer to the osteocytes. So delicate canal called caniculi radiates from each lacuna to its neighbors and allow the osteocytes to keep in touch with each other. And the bone as well is covered with a tough fibrous peristium similar to the perichondrium of cartilage. So about a third of the dry weight of bone is composed of collagen fibers and chondritin sulfate. And two thirds consist, I mean, they have minerals, that is calcium salts, deposited around the collagen fibers. So that is that. And again, away from there, here I show you an image of what I was a bit saying about bone, so that at least you can get it right. So that is what you can see, what you are able to see there, that is an hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, right? Blah, 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 you can see, we have a fetal skull somewhere, right? We have a fetal skull in the microscopic, A, I mean, that is B, right? Microscopic appearance, case A, glass, matrix, open, so it shows you the femur bone of the feta and that. In B, we have external ear. And that is a macroscopic appearance and retrospective location. And then we have intervertebral disc also as example of fibrocartilage. So you see we have hyaline cartilage, fetus cartilage, elastic cartilage, yeah, fibrocartilage, intervertebral disc. Then we go to there. Right? Down again, you see other part of the bone, so in a macroscopic base. That is that you can view it. Yeah, and identify we have bone and blood. Right, so you can see we have ostion in bone, concentric lamella of ostion, central canal, and cane. Then in the blood, we have the white blood cell, the granulos, and neutrophil plates, lymph cells, and the monocytes. That is what normally seen during blood smear. That is why down there we write blood smear. Then the other one is compact bone or osseous tissue. 
So the last part is what we call the blood, and then we call this one the hand. So in blood, we are going to talk about formed elements, erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets. For blood, a blood is just a fluid, and is the only fluid with connective tissue that travels through the tubular vessels, and it, its primary function is transport cells and dissolve matter from place to place. The blood consists of a ground substance called plasma and the cells and cell fragment collectively called formed elements. So let's start. Erythrocytes or red blood cells are the most abundant formed elements in stained blood film. So they look like pink disc with a thin pale center. So they have no nuclear or erythrocyte transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. Again, another one is leukocyte or white blood cells have various roles and defense against infection and other diseases and they travel from one organ to another in the bloodstream and lymph but spend most of their lives in the connective tissue. So the leukocytes are somewhat larger than erythrocytes and have conspicuous nuclei that usually appear violet in stain preparation and there are five kinds and distinguished partly by variation in nuclear shape, neutrophils, xenophils, basophils, lymphocyte, and monocyte are there. So they are five kinds and I say they are distinguished depending on the nuclear shape and we have Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophil, lymphocytes, and monocytes. So the first three are granulocytes. The larger ones are the are granulocytes. And the individual characteristics are considered in details, and we are going to check them later when we are now doing blood or sorry, cardiovascular. So let's see. Platelets are another formed element, and they are small cell fragments scattered amid the blood cells, and they are involving clotting and other mechanisms for minimizing blood loss and encouraging or secreting growth factor that promote blood vessel growth and maintenance. And that is the end. So before we go away from this chapter of connective tissue, we're going to have to see other things. So we are going to, before we go on, I want you to be in position to where you identify what features do most all, collect, all collective tissue have in common to set this class apart from nervous muscular and epithelial tissue. Also, you need to be able to list the cell and fiber types found in the fibrous connective tissue and set their function differences. You also need to be able to know what substances account for the gelatin and consistency of connective tissue. So, you need to identify what is areolar tissue, right? Yeah, and how can it be distinguished from any other kind of connective tissue? Be able to discuss the difference between the dense regular and dense irregular connective tissue. Describe some similarity, difference, and functional relationship between iodine cartilage and the bone. And so, and so, and so, and so. And so, it comes to the end of that. And our next lesson will be on our next video class that will entail nervous and muscular tissue. And the very, very thing that you need to know here is that you need to be in position to, let's see, to identify the nervous tissue, right, what they entail on the muscular tissue. So we are going to see nervous and muscular tissues, which are both excitable tissue. Then from there, we'll check on intracellular junction, glands and membranes, and we do the, that is that. So we'll do exams as long as we love intracellular junction, glands and membranes as the last part, and then we are all welcome. So that is that for now. Thank you so much for being here. This is Medical Student Serona and the presenter is Dr. David Ong Mautia.